so welcome and tonight is a quite wonderful talk well discourse sutta on two main aspects that are very important for us in our meditation practice and this sutta in particular is extremely good at explaining how the mind becomes collected through joy and uplifting uh, with an uplifting object and then which is called uh, by application or with direction directing the mind in a particular way so that we can skillfully use an object to uplift the mind and once it is uplifted we can let go of that object and practice without direction without application and so these um, are vitaka vichara uh, vitaka and vichara are thinking and reflection or thinking and imagining and these are present in the first level of meditation the first jhana and they fade they calm down at the second jhana and this is um, the natural progress of this meditation and this sutta in particular explains what the buddha called dhamma samadhi which i also call dhamma samadhi but sometimes also natural samadhi or natural collectedness of mind and by that i mean just this dhamma samadhi and there is he does not mention it very often but this is really important to us because this really differentiates what we practice right now the kind of samadhi that we start practicing here and the other kind of samadhi which revolves around forcing the mind onto one object and i'm not going to go in great details about the difference between the two but i will simply explain this much so that it's clear that these are two different kinds of samadhi they both concentrate the mind they both collect the mind in their own particular way but the one that we are using is mainly is solely based on the suttas and solely revolving around letting go relaxing and bringing up joy also you might think joy okay but metta has a lot of natural joy in it and uh, will really uplift the mind as well as compassion and joy in the brahma viharas And so that's why the Brahma Viharas, in, in their own particular way, they are the highway to the higher mind, Adi Chitta. And so, this particular sutta is a wonderful sutta especially at the beginning because it explains very clearly this process which needs to be very when we understand that this is how the mind works this is how the mind becomes collected with the joy because when the mind is is we learn to stabilize the mind in the joy by letting go of all the other distractions the mind is happy therefore the distractions are cut away at their root and that is wisdom because we see we understand how the mind works and 
these distractions, we don't follow them along, we just let them go and we cultivate this joy here. And it also, to understand this slowly, we will understand how the mind works and how we will gain a lot of confidence in that particular method. And also explaining these, the two first jhanas, the two first levels of meditation, which is kind of the first step into this whole meditation path. This sutta is called the bhikkhuni's residence or the nun's residence and it talks about the four resting places of awareness, the satipatthanas, but this is directly mm, transferable to the Brahma Viharas, the metta, and we will just discover that as we go. Having dressed up in the morning, the venerable Ananda took his bowl and robe, went to the nun's residence and sat down on a prepared seat. Then many nuns approached him, paid loving respects, and sat down in front of him. Then a nun asked, or said, to, said this, Bhante Ananda, many nuns, the meditating with a mind well settled in the four resting places of awareness, the four satipatthanas, are experiencing wonderful progress. So it is, sisters, so it is. Indeed, sisters, whosoever, monk or nun, meditates with a mind well settled in the four resting places of awareness it can be expected that they will experience wonderful progress. Then the Venerable Ananda ta taught the Dhamma to the nuns, having taught, sparked, uplifted and gladdened them. He stood from his seat and departed. In the afternoon, having walked for alms in Sawati, the Venerable Ananda approached the awakened one, paid loving respects, sat down to one side and told him all that just took place, but this is a whole repetition which I will not go into. So it is, Ananda, so it is, Ananda. Indeed, Ananda, whosoever, monk or nun, meditating with a mind well settled in the four resting places of awareness, it can be expected that they will experience wonderful progress. What are the four? Here, Ananda, one meditates aware of body as body, intent, fully aware, and present, letting go of tension and distractions. As one meditates, now this is a template for the Satipatthanas, but it is a very uh, general template that we can use also for the Brahma Viharas, you will see. As one meditates aware of body as body, resting awareness upon body, bodily discomfort arises, one's mind becomes lazy or distracted outwardly. There's a distraction somehow. Then one should apply one's mind to an uplifting object. And that is where the Buddha, in fact, and this is something that I um, often delineate, is that interestingly we speak a lot of meditation objects, but the Buddha in the discourses, the original discourses, does not mention many uh, actual objects of meditation. And this is one of the ways that he describes it. But you will see with the second fold of this practice, you will see why we are in fact letting go slowly 
as we learn to cultivate wholesome states, we will dissolve all the objects <laughs> and we will slowly let go of all these wholesome things that we use to purify the mind, but moving always towards letting go of all objects in the end. By doing so, by applying one's mind to an uplifting object, gladness arises. From gladness comes joy, piti. Joyful in mind, one's body is relaxed. Relaxed in body, one experiences happiness or ease. And a happy mind becomes collected naturally. And this is a very important sequence in the Buddha's teaching that you will get to hear quite often on this retreat. And then there is the going beyond thoughts, which he explained in many discourses as well. Afterwards, one reflects, this is the reason why I have applied my mind. It has become collected, calm. My intention was fulfilled. I can now let it go. Letting go of the object that we use to uplift the mind. One then lets it go and neither thinks nor imagines. And one knows, not thinking nor imagining, I am happy, present, inwardly. And here this is the template that we also can use in our meditation. Whatever our Brahma Viharas that we work with. Uh, and this friend or this place in nature or this puppy or this kitten or this child or this these words that we use to uplift the mind they are that application we are using we are directing the mind towards these wholesome things and once we do that enough and we start the mind starts being uplifted becomes more steady then we can let go of these objects and simply stay with the metta for example and later on we can also apply this principle simply with metta when metta becomes very easy to to bring up, we don't need an object for the metta anymore. We can simply bring it up. Then the metta can be that, also that direction of the mind that we are using. And perhaps you will get to experience a bit these later stages and understand how the metta will, in fact, create this really stable and wholesome environment to for the mind to go rapidly into the higher states so that is a really wonderful way we can use it also on another occasion and he goes through the four satipatthanas i will only go through it once more just to make sure this sequence is well understood and then we will move along one meditates aware of sensations as sensations intent fully aware and present letting go of tension and distractions as one meditates aware of sensations as sensations, resting awareness upon sensations. Bodily discomfort arises. One's mind becomes lazy or distracted outwardly. And there are ways that we can practice metta that are very close to the, to the four resting places of awareness. 
Um, and metta fits very well in that category of sensations because it is a sensation that we are it is a wholesome sensation that we are cultivating but it, if we later this is a bit more advanced but later in the practice we can learn to also develop it without being very attached to it or involved it is there but we see it as only a sensation but that is also related to seeing things as impersonal and uh, we will slowly build that understanding as we go then one should apply one's mind to an uplifting object by doing so gladness arises pamoja from gladness comes joy piti joyful in mind one's body is relaxed Relaxed in body, one experiences happiness, and a happy mind becomes collected naturally. Afterwards, one reflects, this is the reason why I have applied my mind. My intention was fulfilled. I can now let that object go. One then lets go Let's go and neither thinks nor imagine. And one knows, not thinking nor imagining, I am happy, present, inwardly. And so there is this practice when, if we feel the need to have an object to uplift the mind, if we need this to kindle the metta at the beginning, that's fine. And then there is also the practice of simply resting into the metta itself, where this links to the Buddha's direct instructions of simply suffusing it, allowing it to suffuse everywhere, and simply resting in this. And this is the, the beginning, the direction where this practice is going. And now, of course, he goes through mind as mind and mental states as mental states, Dhamma. And he says, this is how there is development by application. And this is... And how is there development without application? One does not apply one's mind outwardly. One understands, my mind is not applied outwardly. It is unconstricted, liberated, unapplied before and after. Meditating aware of body as body, intent, fully aware and present, I am happy. So this is quite a wonderful sutta where the, the Buddha makes it quite clear. He uses the word sukha quite a bit and the word piti and the word pamoja which are gladness, joy, happiness, ease, um, pasadi, tranquility. And these are all the seven factors of awakening and how they work. And this is another uh, strength of this sutta is that it makes quite clear the Buddha's teaching uh, is about happiness and is about cultivating that joy. Once again, one does not apply one's mind outwardly. One understands my mind is not applied outwardly to a specific object. It is unconstricted liberated, unapplied, before and after. Meditating, aware of sensations as sensations, intent, fully aware and present. I am happy. And so, the Buddha, in fact, we need to know the discourses where he says that, 
but he says definitely to to take delight in that to take delight because this is a completely blameless kind of happiness and when we sit with the metta that is completely completely open completely boundless not we're not forcing but it's simply it simply is happening you know very very simple and there is great happiness in this and as the mind calms down it gets better and better so this is what the buddha is saying here and we will discover every more steps of this process uh, throughout the retreat but this is quite a good a good beginning and then he says well of course he goes through uh, mind and mental states and I will skip through this because I, we simply want to have this um, little dewdrop of teaching here this is how there comes to be development without application Ananda, I have taught you development by application and development without application. What should be done by a teacher for his students, holding their best interests at heart, out of loving compassion, that I have done for you, Ananda. There are these roots of trees, Ananda. There are these empty huts. Meditate, Ananda. Do not be neglectful, lest you become remorseful when the time has passed. This is my advice to you. This is what the Awakened One said with an uplifted mind, the Venerable Ananda, delighted in the, the Awakened One's words. And so here this wraps up. Yes, did you have a question? Okay, good. This wraps up um, the first uh, part of this, this discourse. And this allows us a very wonderful glimpse at really um, some of the best of the Buddha's teaching. And this is fairly hard to contradict because it's so clear <laughs> and it is explaining very clearly the first steps of the first jhana and the second jhana and I will break these uh, levels of meditation down to you in future talks but this is a bit of an introduction and the other fold of this talk is um, different similes, different analogies that are really helpful for us to contemplate while we practice loving-kindness meditation or metta. And these are part of a sutta that is called the simile of the saw, which I will not read. I will not read the simile of the saw itself, but there are very wonderful analogies uh, that the Buddha gives in this particular sutta. And I read part of it today in the guided meditation, but this is um, this is exactly what follows after this. So these, these, um, this imagery and this um, analogy and way of uh, showing that the Buddha has, um, the Buddha in fact taught a lot using similes. And in fact, there is a sutta where he says how to teach and there's five points and one of them is I should um, always teach with 
using uh, imagery or um, analogies. And so, the, and the Buddha was very, very skilled in, in this uh, particular uh, way of explaining things. And the more we read the suttas, we start realizing how wonderful he, his way of teaching was. Because this is, he said, this is how a lot of wise people understand, <laughs> really. And so, here it is, there's uh, four, four um, analogies that can really uh, leverage our practice. And it is in relation when someone comes to us with hurtful intentions and or or harsh speech and so you will um, this is also a very wonderful sequence that we can use when some problematic person or situation arises and this is the teaching on how to deal with these things There are five possible manners of speech that other people could say to you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or false, soft or harsh, bent on goodness or bent upon harm, with a loving mind or with inner hate. If others should speak to you in any of these ways, at that time you should train in this way. Our minds will be unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being, not obsessed by resentment. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love and with this as a support we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart filled with love, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger nor resentment. This is how you should train monks. And here again we see how the Buddha explains you start with one person, but then also you should continue to not stop there, continue and suffuse the entire universe, just like that. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> and this is, you know, this is a sequence that comes back over and over in many different forms, but essentially it is the same like this. Just as if a person would arrive with a shovel and a basket and say, I shall take away the earth from this great big earth. He would dig some soil here and there. He would scatter some soil here and there, spit here and there, and urinate here and there, saying, Be without earth, be without earth. What do you think, monks? Could that person take away the earth with this great could that person take away the earth from this great big earth? No, Bhante. Why? Because, Bhante, this great big earth is deep and immeasurable. It is not possible to take away its earth. That person could only reap misery and disappointment. There are five possible manners of speech that, others, that other people could say to you. If others should speak to you in any of these previous ways, at that time you should train in this way, monks. Our minds will be unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love caring for their well-being not obsessed by anger. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love. And with this as a support, 
we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart like the earth, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger nor resentment. This is how you should train monks. Just as if a person were to come with yellow, blue, and red paint, and he would say, I will paint shapes in the air. I will make forms appear in the air. What do you think, monks? Could that person paint shapes in the air and make forms appear? No, Bhante. Why? Because, Bhante, space is without form, without attribute. It is not possible to paint shapes on it and make forms appear on it. That person could only reap misery and disappointment. There are five possible manners of speech that other people could say to you, monks. And if others should speak to you in such a way, at that time you should train. Our mind will be, will be unshaken, and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being, not obsessed by anger. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love. And with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart like space, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger nor resentment. This is how you should train monks. Just as if a person were to come with a blazing grass torch and would say, With my blazing grass torch, I shall burn away and dry up the river Ganges. What do you think, monks? Could that person burn away and dry up the river Ganges with a blazing grass torch? No, Bhante. Why? Because, Bhante, the river Ganges is deep and immeasurable. It is not possible to burn it away and dry it up with a blazing grass torch. That person can only reap misery and disappointment. So it is, monks, and so you should train. Our minds will be unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being, not obsessed by anger. We will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love. And with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart like the river Ganges vast, expanded, boundless, without anger nor resentment. This is how you should train. Just as there was a skin bag which was polished, smoothly polished, thoroughly smoothly polished, soft and silky, oiled and not dry, and a person came with a stick and a pebble and said, I shall make this skin bag rustle and crackle. What do you think, monks? Could that monk, could that person make this thoroughly sm smoothly polished skin bag rustle and crackle with a stick and a pebble? No, Bhante. Why? Because, Bhante, that skin bag is polished, thoroughly smoothly polished, soft and silky, oiled and not dry. It is not possible to make it rustle and crackle with a stick and a pebble. That person could only reap misery and disappointment. And so it is, monks, and so you should train. Our minds will remain unshaken and we will not retaliate with hurtful words. We will dwell with a heart full of love, caring for their well-being, 
not obsessed by anger, we will dwell suffusing that person with a heart filled with love. And with this as a support, we will dwell suffusing the all-encompassing universe with a heart like a skin bag, vast, expanded, boundless, without anger nor resentment. This is how you should train. And so, with these wonderful similes and the skin bag, this ends this first discourse of the second day. And I hope this was uh, helpful to you in understanding a bit more about the practice. Okay. Let us share some merits and um, we will go. It is said that listening, having the chance to listen to the Dharma and uh, to practice through th throughout this retreat, to take a retreat and to actually deepen in our own practice is one of the highest merits that we can do. In fact, it is the highest merit that we can do, the Buddha explains in many suttas. And listening, having this wonderful opportunity to get together and to hear what the Buddha said and um, to have a chance to hear the Dhamma is quite, quite a wonderful uh, thing and to incline, only incline our minds to goodness, to the good law is in itself uh, has tremendous wholesome repercussions around us and uh, what we do. So hopefully all beings can partake in this and this is why we also practice our generosity at the end of every day. We dedicate everything that we do on retreat for the benefit of all living beings. So that is why we share merits at the end. Dukkha patta jani dukkha bhaya patta jani bhaya soka patta jani soka hantu sabbe pipani no idang no punyang sabbe satta nu modantu sabba sampatti siddhiya aga satta cha bhumatta devanaga mahi dikkha Punyang tang anumo ritwa, chirang rakkant buddha sasasanang. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha sasana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I wish you a very good, fruitful meditation this evening and restful night. And I will see you tomorrow morning.